On behalf of Northern Illinois University's STEM Read and the University Libraries, welcome to Future Telling. I'm Jillian King Cargyle. I'm the director of STEM Read. I'm also a writer and a professional science appreciator. I'm so excited to bring you tonight's conversation, past, present, and futurism, with our guests Valerie Garver, Maurice Broadus, Lynn Thomas, and Mary Robinette Kowal. This event has been in development in several forms over the course of the last year and a half, and I'd like to thank Fred Barnhart, Dean of the University Libraries, for his creativity and collaboration, Sarah Finnegan for her support and flexibility, Christine Brevelli O'Brien for her planning skills, and the Friends of the University Libraries and NIU STEAM for their support. We'd also like to thank the Division of Outreach, Engagement, and Regional Development and the Division of Research and Innovation Partnerships for their commitment to community programming. Future telling comes from the idea that both scientists and writers are dreamers. They see the world as it is, imagine what it could be, and then work to make that dream possible. And even though their tools and methods are different, scientists and writers have been influencing each other for years. Mary Shelley was influenced by the natural philosophers of her day studying electricity as she created Frankenstein. This inspired the inventor of the pacemaker who used the idea of the spark of life to help hearts continue to beat. Animator Chuck Jones inspired future rocketry experts with his cartoon drawings of rockets in Wile E. Coyote and Duck Dodgers. Those NASA scientists inspired the makers of Star Trek, which inspired more kids to become scientists and spurred more innovation. With Future Telling, we want to be more intentional about bringing together great thinkers across multiple disciplines. Here at NIU, we're perfectly situated to do just that. As a research institution, we have the vast resources of our faculty and staff. We also have a wonderful partnership with Argonne National Lab and Fermilab, who are working on world-changing science. We have an amazing library with incredible collections, including the archives of the Science Fiction Writers of America. We have a wonderful network of students and alumni. Now more than ever, we need to be creative and imaginative and pro-science. We hope that these conversations will help spur change and bring about a brighter future. Our first guest is Valerie Garver, who will join me in a pre-recorded presentation. After that, I'll join Maurice Broadus, Lynn Thomas, and Mary Robinette Kowal for our live conversation and a Q&A session. Here's my interview with historian Valerie Garver. So my name is Valerie Garber, and I'm a professor of history at Northern Illinois University, and I'm also chair of the history department. Um, but my research is on the Middle Ages, and I'm actually an early medievalist, but as the only medievalist at NIU, I teach about the entire period. Um, so I definitely teach about epidemics in the Middle Ages. And in addition, um, I'm an expert on medieval textiles. And so I take a special interest in the history of textiles as well. One of my central questions is, how do epidemics and plagues affect art and literature? And what have you seen throughout your studies? They definitely have an effect. Um, some of the ways that they affect art and literature is, um, in some cases, people's direct responses to um, epidemics or disease. Um, and sometimes it's just a kind of reflection backwards on um, certain pandemics. So a good example and a very famous one, I would say, is uh, Giovanni Boccaccio's Decameron. Um, I think many people know this text and may, may have read it at some point in their lives. Um, it's definitely taken on new resonance, I think, with, with COVID-19. So more people are reading it now, I think, than maybe were reading it in the past. Um, he was a Florentine writer, and he set this um, collection of stories um, at the time of the Black Death in Florence. And the conceit of the, um, the book is that these young Florentine men and women decide to kind of escape to the countryside to try to avoid getting the plague and to entertain themselves, they tell each other stories. And so it's the collection allegedly of the stories they told each other. But the book includes, I would say, one of the most famous descriptions of the Black Death. Um, and I would say historians have spent some time trying to decide 
how much it's accurate and how much it takes sort of a dramatic kind of um, license to make it a better tale. In many respects, this is more a uh, reflection, not just upon like the epidemic of the Black Death, but also kind of upon what is the nature of um, human relations. So there's a lot in the text about how do people relate to one another um, and framing it in this way, I think gives Boccaccio um, a good way of kind of inviting his readers to ponder bigger issues while being entertained. They're very, enter many of them are very entertaining stories. Um, so you have that, but you also have um, cases where you have artists um, or people who are writing literature who respond, I would say, more directly to what they see around them. This is an image of a 1349 manuscript illustration from the annals. And so just so you, everyone knows, the, an annal is a recording of the big events, um, usually year by year. These were um, pretty common texts in the Middle Ages. But these particular annals were written by a Benedictine monk who lived in Ternay in Belgium. His name was um, Gilles de Musset. He um, wrote an account of what he saw. There's a nice image in one of the manuscripts that was probably produced very close to the time. And it's interesting because it doesn't actually show people suffering from the Black Death. It shows people's kind of social response. Um, and because it shows the preparation of coffins. Um, because so many people died um, in the, the Black Death. Now, estimates vary, <laughs> um, but it could be around 30%. That's a pretty common uh, percentage that's put out of the European population um, in Western Europe, and of course that's where Belgium is, um, would have died, and they died quite quickly. And this is a very unusual image because we think it was done very close to the time, actually, the Black Death. So, and that's something that like, you know, you can look at later pandemics, like say uh, the flu pandemic um, in 1918, um, which I now feel like so many people have seen images of that um, in the news. And you can see there's lots and lots of photographs. And that is such a valuable kind of source now for historians and art historians to look at. Um, but you can also see it's kind of an immediate response. And that kind of thing is sometimes lacking in a world before photography. Um, but we also have an image of the formation of flagellants there. So this was a religious response to the Black Death that um, occurred in some, uh, especially Northern European towns. And these um, individuals thought that the Black Death was a punishment from God for sin. And so they would walk in processions, often whipping themselves, hence the name flagellants. In some cases, it's uh, not just that the artists are sort of recording or responding to say social unrest, but they're also leaving a kind of record or a kind of consideration of how people tried to deal with the pandemic and how maybe they thought they could stop it. And you can see um, responses to the Black Death for a long time afterwards, especially because bubonic plague recurred um, in, um, in Europe and also of course in other parts of the world. Um, but a good example is I've provided just one image of the dance of death. These are scenes that I think a lot of people are sort of familiar with. Um, and, you know, there's a really nice book um, out by a woman named Alina Gertzman um, about the dance of death that's pretty recent, which if anyone's really interested in that, it's a great um, book to check out. But you can see here um, an image um, from Croatia from the 15th century. And the idea of these dance, dances of death um, images is that they're showing people from all walks of life. Everyone from like a ruler, because you can see a king in this image, to just like a merchant, because there's a merchant in this image, and um, women, men and women, old and young. The idea was that everyone recognized the Black Death didn't spare anyone, right? And it would, these were kind of images that were um, meant to prepare people for death, to say you should take care of um, your sins, you should atone, you should ponder the fact that your life may be cut short. These were both religious images, but they're, they're very reflective, I think, of kind of a response to how people dealt with this kind of um, really horrific pandemic at the time. It's interesting that you uh, 
mentioned the unrest going hand in hand with these pandemics. So you have that artistic response, a literary response, and then you have the civil unrest. Um, do you think that some of the things that happen, are happening today are mirroring that cycle of response to the pandemic? I mean, I think it is possible to draw a few kinds of parallels, um, even if they're pretty imperfect. And one is that um, I think anytime you have something that's this frightening or this kind of life altering, because even though um, the death rates are much lower from COVID-19 than from the Black Death, um, it certainly has changed how we, we all behave and the kinds of things that we can or cannot do, even the kinds of things we wear. Um, and how we go about our daily life. And so that's very unsettling. The other thing that I would say um, is uh, kind of parallel um, in addition to the kind of unsettling nature of, of any pandemic would be the economic repercussions. Um, clearly COVID-19 is having some really terrible economic repercussions. Um, and I think it remains to be seen what exactly will happen with that. But um, the Black Death, that uh, definitely caused major changes in the economy, in the labor market, land holding, um, social historians, economic historians, they've done a really amazing job of sort of going back and trying to see how did the Black Death transform many of these um, aspects of life. And I think it's really kind of startling, even to me, like as I like reteach or think about these issues, just how much you can talk about in some cases, um, what was the labor market like prior to the Black Death versus after? Like it's a, it's a big turning point. So drawing from your historical context, what do you see as a possible future for art and literature as a response to this pandemic? I will just offer one thing, which is um, I think that Epidemic disease just never goes away in literature. I think it's something that uh, people have always either been fascinated by, uh, horrified by, it's kind of a voyeuristic thing, reading sometimes about um, pandemics or terrible epidemic disease. And so you see it in quite a lot of literature and um, also in films. And so um, I think that will not go away. The textile arts are a place where we are, we're definitely gonna see a risk, like, a lot happening. Um, I have a slide of a really, um, to me, striking mask, very artistic mask, um, from the company uh, Kalina Strada. And they have a line of masks that they're, they've been making that are made from their dead stock material from past collections. So basically, um, this is a line that, um, or excuse me, company that emphasizes sustainability. So what they're saying is we can take our leftover fabric from our past collections of clothing and we can repurpose it into really striking beautiful masks. Now on the one hand you can look at this and say well it's you know a commodity and they're profiting from this but on the other hand one can look at this from a kind of public health perspective and say if you make masks that people want to wear um, that are a striking statement for them that make them feel like I am um, making a statement to the world. You can may be able to get some more people to wear masks. In addition, I really want to highlight quilters. Um, I think they're such an important um, group of artists, especially right now. Um, and there are a couple ways to kind of think about what they're doing. I included um, an image of some masks made by quilters and donated. So very quickly, scientists figured out that quilting fabric is really excellent fabric for uh, face coverings. It's quite effective and very breathable. And quilters are, of course, um, talented um, sewers, and they could just immediately kind of rise to the challenge and sew masks. In addition, especially during the initial lockdowns, they had access to um, troves of fabric that they could like dive into and make masks. And so um, we've seen a lot of quilters kind of rise to the challenge. And I think this is something that will eventually, I hope, be artistically more documented. There are definitely quilter groups and there are um, uh, folk art experts who are already gathering kind of examples um, of how quilters respond in this way in terms of providing some form of PPE, sometimes even making gowns. But I kind of thought very early on, I would imagine the quilters will eventually 
have responses that are similar to the responses that we see with or saw, excuse me, with the AIDS epidemic. So um, the one that I think many people are familiar with are, is the NAMES Project AIDS Memorial Quilt. Um, it was begun in 1985 by Cleve Jones, and I have an image here. This particular image of it is from 1996, and this is when the quilt was so large because there had been um, so many individuals memorialized that it covered the entire National Mall. Um, but there are definitely um, quilts that have already been made, um, both quilts that quilters have made um, in order to raise money. Um, so they are selling the quilts and then providing the money, say, to food banks or something like that, but also specific quilts meant to kind of memorialize the moment. And I was really struck by one I've included here. It's a quilt by um, Silvia Hernandez, um, who's a master quilter and also um, an activist. And I think this is a really striking quilt because um, you just are, the coronavirus right in the center of it is, just really draws the eye. Um, but you can see, um, this idea of kind of promoting the right action that may save people from it. Um, and it's a really, I think, really striking quilt. But certainly, I think in other areas of art, we're gonna definitely see responses. Um, there have been responses to many sort of epidemic diseases. I know there was a kind of nice New York Times piece about artistic responses with a lot of um, paintings, actually, from different epidemics over the years. Um, and so I would imagine that that we, we just have to wait and see um, where this um, ep epidemic causes artists to respond in certain ways. So I would imagine that. And certainly the last thing I would mention is, as a historian, I'm well aware of the desire to memorialize, which is an impulse that humans have had for a very long time. And so I'd imagine that eventually there will be memorials um, to those who died of COVID-19, um, probably specific memorials um, for, you know, uh, the frontline healthcare workers, people like that. So I would imagine at some point that will start, start to happen as well. Now more than ever, we can tell like this is history. We are, we are in a point in history that's going to be remembered. So do you have any advice for people in um, documenting those, those first person experiences that they're having right now? Yes, as a historian, I would say it's really important to have a wide variety of records. Um, and so I think, you know, there have already been efforts to kind of encourage people to keep, say, journals. And I think there's a lot of great journal prompts out there. So even if you're someone you're like, I don't even know what to write in a journal, no one would be interested in anything I have to say, um, there have been some really effective sort of prompts that have been provided by people, like, and also even for kids, right, that this is how you can write and kind of respond to it. So journals are great, but I also think there are things like um, ephemera that I think are worth keeping. Um, so, for example, I've noticed a lot of, like, comic strips have been responding, and you can see that because um, my, my kids love comics and so I've been seeing this and even I have kept a few because I think that's like an important thing to keep but like even ephemera like things like grocery store receipts um, like you know just sort of a memory of what was it that I bought because people are buying in a different way that's the kind of thing historians will later study like what did the average grocery store receipt look like during the lockdown versus before um, because, you know, that would let us measure things like, were people really buying up all that toilet paper, <laughs> you know? Um, but also, I think, like, like what quilters have done, like, I think an artistic response is also a really valuable thing. And even if, you know, you don't think of yourself as necessarily artistic, um, it can be a good thing to try. And especially, um, there's a lot of um, efforts, I think, by some artists and certain museums and things like that to try to promote making art at home. Um, first of all, to give some people who, who need an outlet at home something to do. Um, but also I think it will create a kind of like folk art response potentially that will, will be really, really valuable. Um, and the other thing is of course, photos. I mean, people should definitely um, be taking photographs and I would say the more mundane, the better <laughs> as a historian. Um, because sometimes it's the stuff that people think is a bit 
dull or something um, that actually historians can end up being really, really fascinated by. You know, I've seen pictures and from the flu pandemic, 1918, just like someone actually took a photograph of like the stores say that someone had in the hospital. That's very valuable evidence um, and just kind of gives an indication of like what's going on. Um, and I know people have been charmed by things like, I know there's a great photograph out there of a family during that flu pandemic where they made a mask for their dog. <laughs> I mean, just like that kind of record, that's the kind of thing that can really get lost. So I would say anything people can do to record it and also just, okay, you can't keep everything. And I know there's a great desire to declutter, but sometimes it's good just to keep a few things around because objects also become a really great way later that you can talk about what happened. Um, and as a historian, I certainly hope um, that people will someday still be taking kind of oral histories of what's happening now. There's a lot of oral history projects right now that are starting up um, to document how people have experienced COVID-19 um, and ex experienced the lockdown and things like that. But I would imagine, um, you know, 30, 40 years from now, um, there'll be a lot of people who really want to take oral histories from people who live through a much longer kind of experience of it um, to kind of compare to people's initial responses. And sometimes I think having like objects or a diary or something that helps you rethink or try to remember is, is valuable in and of itself for that purpose, or even just to maybe tell your grandchildren, right? That was our interview with Valerie Garver, a historian from NIU. Now I'm going to welcome our panelists. All right, three out of four. <laughs> oh, four out of four. Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for being here for the first official uh, web episode of Future Telling, uh, past, present, and futurism. I'm really excited about the topic and I think it's very fitting that you're all here because you run the continuum of expertise in past, pe present, and futurism. So I would like you to introduce yourselves and tell people a little bit more about what it is you do. Why don't we start with Lynn? Oh, Lynn, I can't hear you. <laughs> Let's Is that see. better? Oh, that's better. See, Here I am. Hi. For a, Sorry. Uh, I was silent <laughs> films. <laughs> that's right. Um, hi, I'm Lynn Thomas. Uh, I am the, in my day job, I am the head of the rare book and manuscript library at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. And I was, before that, the head of the rare book and special collections department at Northern Illinois University. Uh, I am also the co-editor-in-chief and co-publisher of Uncanny Magazine, which is a Hugo Award-winning uh, sci-fi and fantasy online magazine. All right, and we miss you very much at NIU. And I miss now, you too. Oh, we have a visitor. <laughs> this, this is our this is our cat Hugo. <laughs> um, and Mary Robinette, how about you next? Hi, I'm Mary Robinette Kowal. I am also a science fiction and fantasy writer. Uh, my papers are archived at NIU. And I'm the president of Science Fiction and Fantasy Writers of America. All right, and Maurice? Good evening. Oh, can you hear me mm -hmm. okay? Just want to. Okay, okay, good. Uh, so, my name is Maurice Broadus. I'm a, also a science fiction and fantasy author. Uh, I'm a, also a middle grade uh, teacher, and I work in the. Well, I also work uh, as a part of the Carl Brandon Society, and I'm also on the board of the Ray Bradbury Center. And then uh, I do a lot of uh, community development work here in town uh, with a group called the uh, Kepper Institute, where I'm their resident Afrofuturist. All right. See, we've got archivists studying the past. We have um, the connections between science fiction and historical fiction in Mary Robinette. And then we have Afrofuturism. See, it's all, it's all coming together in my head here, people. Um, so... We heard from Valerie Garver, uh, our historian. So I first, I'd like you to react to that. And then I want to know, my big question is, how is this moment in history with this collision of all these historical events, both the, the epidemic, the Black Lives Matter movement, and everything else that's going on, how is that affecting the state of science fiction? 
So I'm, I'm going to jump in. So uh, the Decameron has been one of my favorite pieces of literature for decades. And, and I was so excited to see Valerie drawing those connections. For me, one of the things that is true about any form of art is that it always reflects what is in the front of the author's mind. Um, and that is usually current events. And you can see that when you look at science fiction uh, through through the history of science fiction, um, you know, during uh, during the, the atomic era, that's when you get the golden age of science fiction where everyone is very concerned about, like all of the ships are rocket are, are at, uh, atomic powered, everything it's like, atomic all the time you know when is the a-bomb going to go off and then you've got the green movement uh which is reflecting with green punk you have the information age which gives us cyberpunk uh we're seeing a lot of um dystopians that have been around climate change happening and and i'm predicting that you know we're, we're gonna wind up with stuff about pandemics i i know that i suddenly the the novel that i'm writing which is a, a right now, which is set 20, 30 years in the future, I, I'm suddenly like, oh, it, it's completely unrealistic that none of these characters have masks. Um, so I think it's I think it's too soon to know exactly how it will, uh, how it will affect, but I, I think that we are going to see a lot of things that are coming out about being confined. Hmm. I'm, I'm hearing COVID punk. Can we coin that right now? <laughs> Do we have no. to? <laughs> I think pandemic punk is pandemic punk. Oh, that's pretty we, awesome. We don't need to make it punk. We can just address it as it is. I mean, you know, <laughs> yeah, it, that's true. if everyone's gone through it and you're writing about the contemporary experience, then it's not really a punk thing. Like if there's nothing underground about COVID, it's kind of <laughs> pervasive. Um, so I, I'm, I'm just going to mildly protest punking it because I don't think that fits. Um, I think that, that one of the, challenges of being in the middle of a historic moment um, when you're living through it is that, you know, most of the time we go through our lives and we aren't thinking about the fact that we're living through a historic moment. We're just trying to get through the day, the week, the deadline, the child care, the parent care, the experience of living. Um, when you have the realization that you are also living in a historic moment, um, behaviors change, patterns change, your approach to everything changes. Um, sometimes that's a conscious choice and sometimes it's just how the weirdness leaks when it when you react to it. Um, and I think that that's one of the things that we're starting to see um, across the country is that when you have this combination of a convergence of multiple historic events, it's a moment where people are suddenly caught isn't that they are living in a historic moment in a way that they've not had to really think about. And the weight of that is something that often triggers responses that are different than they might be if they weren't thinking about the fact that they're living in a historic moment. Everything feels like it has much more weight, even what brand of toilet paper you're going to buy, assuming there's more than one brand in the store at any given time. Because now the fact that there's two brands means that there's historic weight that they got the supply chain sorted enough that you have a choice of brands, as opposed to buying the one package that is still left when you made it to the target. So I think that that's one of the big things that, um, changes art and changes our response to how we live is just that the the experiential weight of living through a truly historic moment is one that adds a layer of sort of trauma and emotional burden to folks that um, may or may not have coping mechanisms for that depending on what their life circumstances are and and so you have folks who are going through trauma for the very first time, and you have folks who have been through trauma who are being re-traumatized, and that adds additional layers of fun times for everybody going through a major historic event or seven simultaneously. Yeah, I think uh, one of the things that we always talk about is the fact that, you know, we're, we're right now, we're yes, we're experiencing twin pandemics, uh, both with the racial oppression and with uh, COVID-19. but. Uh, as far as, but then uh, one of the things we also look at is, you know, well, a couple of different things. So one, we don't think in terms of post-pandemic, period. Uh, we, we just go, you know, we just have to, we're all about creating the new normal. What is going to be the new normal moving forward? 
Um, there's no point in wishing for the, the good old days or the, the BC times uh, of before COVID. Uh, no, it's about we are in this moment now. We adapt now. We move forward from here. Um, so what does that look like? We are at a crossroads. We have opportunity here to uh, create a new normal. Uh, what, uh, the, the twin pandemics have, have revealed cracks in the system, showing where, um, where the system hasn't always served all of us. And so now we have opportunities to uh, tear down some of those institutions and, and, and practices that, that weren't working for us and, and the opportunity to create something new. So I think one of the key things has always been how do we keep an adaptive mindset in order to you know, ch be challenged by the moment and move forward in the moment. I like that you brought up. But as far as uh, how it affects, uh, oh, I, I was just going to say, as far as how it might affect sci-fi, I'm just dreading looking at the uh, apex slush pile uh, here before yeah. too long because yeah, it's, it's going to be brutal. All me in my basement. Yeah. yeah. Feeling scared. I, I'm just glad that. Um, same, well, same for Uncanny. Yeah. When we open, it's, it's going to be pandemic arama all the time. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I love that Maurice brought up the idea of opportunity. I think certainly in all of your work, uh, there is a hopefulness for the future. Uh, Mary Robinette, your uh, Lady Astronauts series, deals with a, a catastrophe of, on a world scale. Um, and reading it, certainly you think like, oh, yeah, I should be uh, rationing food and uh, preparing to go to space right now, too. Um, <laughs> but how, how, does that, how does that idea of opportunity play into science fiction or where all of you hope science fiction will lead? I mean, for me, um, for, for me, the thing that always kind of drives me is that, that we as like humans are made of narrative. So the thing that I'm interested in is narratives that shape uh, shape kind of ideas towards a future that I want to live in, which is a towards a, a future that is more hopeful and inclusive. Um, that sometimes means you have to smash a meteor into the earth. But but the other thing for me about science fiction and fantasy that I think we have. Um, as a leg up over some of the other forms, is that we're able to provide people with um, kind of a, a metaphor with which to examine things that are happening in, in our current lives. It's one of the reasons I'm often attracted to historical fiction, and then add that additional layer of the science fiction on top of it, because it puts things at just enough of a remove that you can have a conversation about things that are happening right now. Uh, and there are, you know, the, there are race riots and uh, that are happening in in my novels because they're set in the 1950s and 60s. And the reason they're still happening now is because it's a problem that we still haven't fixed. Uh, you know, it's it's this so this cyclical thing that keeps happening, um, which also then means that a reader can apply that same pattern and look forward into the future, into the kind of Afrofuturism that that Maurice writes. I was hoping that was going to be a really smooth segue handoff. That... <laughs> oh, 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 sorry. I missed my cue. I feel so bad now. Um, uh, <laughs> I'm just, okay. So, uh, all right. So, could, could you re 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 repeat your question for me real quick? Um, the idea of opportunity and how opportunity will play into your work at this moment, right? Rather than, like, going dystopian if we're, if we're going more towards a hopeful future. Yeah. Right. And so for me, uh, in, in my fiction, uh, especially currently, has always been about, you know, dreaming about the future. So with, with Afrofuturism, I mean, Afrofuturism itself is, it's, it's rooted in the past, it, uh, but critiques the present, but it always looks towards the future. Um, I, I remember uh, the, uh, Tanana Reeve Du said that uh, even the act of uh, dreaming of ourselves in the future is an act of resistance. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've always sort of carried that to, to heart. And so for me, it's all about Again, I keep coming back to this whole idea of opportunity because we have the opportunity to dream of, of new futures. And, and I just cannot overstate the importance of that enough. Um, in fact, so much so that uh, it's actually impacted our community work in a very real way. So now even the language you use in our community work is about how do we go about creating our desired future state? 
uh, it's, it's always like we we have this now, we exist now, and, and a lot of organizations live in the well. We have to survive today. We have to survive today, and then they don't allow themselves room to dream about what tomorrow could look like. So we have the opportunity as as creatives, we get to uh, to dream about the future, to dream about what uh, the, the, the endless possibilities that, that that could happen, and then by doing that. Um, and by casting that vision, now we have the opportunity to say, all right, if that's where we want to be, if that's what who we uh, who we want to be and what we want to be, then what are the steps we can take in the present in order to get there? And I, I think that's one of the, the critical roles that we have as artists, as creatives, and as storytellers. Absolutely. I mean, from an editorial perspective, um, both Maurice and Mary Robinette are correct. Uh, the the act of envisioning a future existence is a radical act of hope and um, the kinds of stories that we often look for at Uncanny are stories that are focused on the hopeful part of, of survival and perseverance because, well, because one of the best ways to tell a story is to torture the heck out of your characters. But if, if, it's, if it, perseverance and hope are the things that make it worth getting through the part where you're torturing your characters. Um, so I think that's one of the, the big challenges too is that um, when you're in the middle of a historical event and you're and you've got the sort of additional weight of the knowledge of that sitting on you it I think it makes it sometimes more challenging to um, to approach things hopefully because it's not a naive kind of hopefulness it is a hopefulness that is firmly rooted in the struggle that is ongoing um, and and it requires I think a certain amount of stubbornness um, to, that lends itself to the perseverance that gets us through to the new normal. Um, and that's, you know, we're, we're like many folks who are trying to figure out what the new normal looks like in their workplaces right now, I'm doing that in the day job. And, you know, we keep talking about the before times and the new normal and having to make that distinction because we realize that the way that we used to do things literally isn't going to work for the foreseeable future and we need to embrace that and use it as an opportunity to rethink the way that we provide services, um, particularly in a end of the field in rare books where the emphasis for decades has been on person in-person interaction with physical materials. Uh, and now we're trying to pivot our entire business to how do we provide these services remotely? How do we give, how do we make this a valuable experience when you can't actually touch or smell or feel the book in front of you because it's being handled by someone on the other end of the internet? Um, so, you know, we're, we come up against that all the, right, right now because we're trying to redo these things. And the fact that we are thinking through this and saying, that we can do it is an act of hope. We're saying that there is still value in the work that we do, even if the way that we are providing those services is going to be radically different for the foreseeable future. Ooh, I'm seeing virtual reality and virtual smell pods. Like, get your, get your book <laughs> smell. <laughs> Turn the pages. Wait, you know, the, the, that is a thing. When we were working on the Nebula conference, one of the things that we thought about was what are people missing it? And one of the things that we just thought was that people were missing uh, the sense of tactile. So we actually sent, even though we had this virtual conference, we actually sent everyone in the mail a package that had a paper program. Um, they got name badges that they could wear so that, you know, it felt like you were going, that you had been there, that you had, you had proof. Uh, because that's one of the hardest things about this kind of existence is that when you when I get up and walk away, I have no proof that I was here. And so so giving people something tangible or tactile or a follow up thing uh, in the mail that comes afterwards is a way to to kind of make this real to root it and ground it. And it speaks to Valerie's discussion of ephemera because that's the, especially the kind of ephemera that you can provide that allows for documentation of a moment that happened mostly virtually, um, you know, especially if it wasn't recorded, which this is, but not all of the, the experiences that we're having online are. And I do love my Nebula glass. I, <laughs> I was very excited to get that in the mail, and I feel particularly science-y when I have a nice cocktail in my Nebula glass. Um, yeah, so it's really satisfying, though, right? It is. Is. Yeah, um, that's i there's so much so many ways we could go with this. I want to think a little bit about um, <laughs> uh, 
Um, your relationship to science. So all of you are science fiction authors and storytellers and story sharers. Um, what is your relationship to science and do you see yourselves as science communicators or science ambassadors? Well, I do have a degree in biology and was spent 20 years as an environmental toxicologist. So <laughs> that, um, <laughs> um, but, uh, and actually it's, it's interesting cause I actually hadn't used my science degree in, in the bulk of my writing until recently. Mm. Um, and it's only been recently, in fact, it, with dreaming about, about the future, it's like, wait, what, what could things look like, you know, a hundred years from now? Um, and then all of a sudden it's like, man, I got to dust that thing <laughs> off and, uh, start putting it to use again. Um, but in order to have that science drive, uh, drive the stories and, and then communicate it in such a way that, uh. Uh, people aren't feeling preached at or aren't feeling like, well, you know, he's just trying to teach me something, you know. So uh, it's, it's been interesting sort of, uh, you know, delving back into my roots there. Yeah. So for me, it's a little bit different because I don't have a background in science, really. Um, and so I'm the ultimate dumb reader as an editor. If I can't understand the science that a writer has presented in the story, then we know that the science needs to be rewritten in a way that it's more parsable for an audience that doesn't understand the science. So it, that that's mi that's my major role is saying this 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 is not comprehensible to a layperson. We need to find a better way to communicate these concepts uh, so that you can use this to drive the story. Um, and then we can go back and do the the accuracy checking. But you know, for me, it's much more about serving as a person who can help bridge the gap between information and information that is parsable by someone who does not have immediate expertise. Yeah, and I I was an art major in college and then went on to have a 25-year career in puppetry. So, uh, no. Um, but I... Um, <laughs> I love science. Like I actually wanted to be a uh, a veterinarian up until my senior year of high school, um, and and I'm in science fiction partly because it was what I read, but also because it gives me the opportunity to indulge my natural curiosity in ways that are socially acceptable, and I I don't have to feel um, I, I don't have to do the math, right? Um, someone else can do all of the the math for me. And, and I can just put it into my novels and make it look like I'm real smart. And I'm not in that particular area. Um, but I did wind up backing into being, I think, a science communicator because I have been doing so much research about space. And because I am so enthusiastic about it, I'll wind up doing live tweets of like spacewalks or launches where I'm translating for people and, and giving them like giving them all, bits and pieces from the backstage tours that I've gotten to do in order to and all of the stuff that I can't fit into the books. It's just it's just so cool. Um, so so yes, but it wasn't on purpose. I think it's funny that your main character is a mathematician. <laughs> and you... I did not do any of the math. I treat it like a magic system. Uh, and if, if you pay attention to the novel, she sounds like she's doing math at the beginning because I mentioned the pieces of a couple of, equa of of an equation. And then after that, it's just, and then Elma did math. Ooh. <laughs> um, but you do work with uh, experts from NASA, isn't that right? Some, yeah. Uh... <laughs> NASA has been very generous. Um, actually, everyone has been very generous. So I have... Like the the science in the novels are is as cl accurate and close to being correct as I can get it, um, which which means for anything that the character is going to interact with directly. Uh, so that means that all of my space stuff is uh, is on point. I worked with um, an epidemiologist because I have a polio outbreak. Um, so worked with an epidemiologist and a couple of emergency room doctors and, um, uh, oh shoot, one of the other terms has just gone out of my head, orthopedic surgeon as well, um, to figure out what, oh, and uh, two flight surgeons, to figure out what, how you would react to something like polio or an epidemic on the moon. Um, and it's, it has been, uh, shockingly useful research for this 
present that I find myself in. Yeah, that's an interesting point. Yeah, one of the things that oh, Maurice. Uh, one of the things that I realize I've been doing a lot in terms of researching for, for my current series is the the whole idea of the soft sciences. Mm. Um, I've been talking to a lot of the uh, what I call them social practitioners uh, when it comes to uh, community work. When it's, and so it's like, hey, um, psychologists or sociologists or, or actually, I guess uh, even without those formal titles, it's you know, how are we as a people? How do we how do we move through this world? How could we move? How, what would you like to see in terms of communities and, and community living and, and, and relationships? And so it's been a, an interesting, and I've been doing this for like a, about the last year and a half, going around to different groups and sort of like dreaming alongside them um, in terms of like, all right, so if we could tear down, because like, like Mary Robinette, you know, this is not my background. Um, but if I wanted to re, re, uh, redo an entire economic system, you know, what could that look like? Uh, what would it look like to create a system where relationships are at the core of it? What could that look like? Um, you know, how, how could we reorganize as, as people? What, uh, you know, just to, this, just the idea of just thinking about different possibilities, just to come up with just entirely new ways that we can just move through this space as we recreate that space. Yeah, and I, I do want to touch on the aspect of community because all of you are involved in one way or another in community building, both in your actual communities and then within uh, the education community and this uh, science fiction community. So what, how is the pandemic changing the way that we think about community? How is it changing the way that you seek to build community? And what do you hope will come from that? I think it makes it more difficult in some ways because a lot of the practices we had for building community in the before times involved spending time together in person. And for most folks, particularly neurotypical folks, it's one of the easiest ways to get to know someone is to spend time with them in person because we have this whole interstitial language of body language and facial expressions that we use as part of our methods of communicating. And um, there have been studies about the fact that doing similar types of interpretation in face-to-face -face interactions online takes essentially more brain cycles and more energy than it does when you're in person face-to-face. Um, so um, I think that's one of the bigger changes is that sort of the mental load of doing that kind of community building work has, has, has a steeper price than it did uh, before the outbreak. Um, that said, um, I think a lot of the organizational aspects of community building have stayed exactly the same because those happen through the internet over the telephone, through text messaging and things like that. I mean, the, the technology that we have to communicate with each other in a rather instantaneous way, particularly in the middle of things like protests and um, dangerous situations, uh, means that we have a lot more ways of keeping each other safe. Um, and that's an important aspect of community building as well that is enhanced by the fact that we live in the future where the internet is relatively pervasive in most places and we can contact each other pretty easily for the most part, digital divide aside. So. I, I'm. Yeah, I've been thinking about that. Uh, you go. Oh, go ahead. Uh, okay, um, I've been thinking about that a lot, especially with the challenges, the challenges of uh, doing grassroots community organizing, for example. Um, and, and so, so like Lynn said, you know, so we, a lot of a lot of our work had been done in person. I mean, I, I think of the three groups, like uh, you know, me as a middle school t uh, teacher, you know, trying to wrangle middle schoolers, or me in the writing community trying to wrangle writers, which does look a lot like trying to wrangle middle schoolers. Um, and, then, and then on top of that, uh, the, 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 commu the community organizing work. Well, there's some of the work has to still be done in person. I mean, because uh, we live in a food desert. And so we network uh, neighborhood gardeners um, that, uh, in order to you know, get the produce and then distribute the produce. Well, some of that work has to be done in person. There still has to be the, the, on the, the boots on the ground sort of work. Um, so now it's a matter of, all right, well, how do we, how, how do we care for one another during these times? How do we keep one another safe? Um, and yes, we do have these different tools of, of the Zoom and all, all the, uh, all, all of the tools that I'm now so, so sick of. <laughs> um, but, um, 
one things that uh, we one of the things we realize is that you know the core philosophy is actually still the same. Um, it's always about who is the person in front of you. Um, how do you listen to them? How do you continue to learn their story? How, how do you continue to attend to their needs and, and, and read them and, and have them read you? Because um, it still boils down to being people-centered work. Um, and as long as you keep track of that, um, you, can, you can still do things of like, how, what does it look like to connect with them? Uh, what does it look like to support them? Uh, what does it look like to pursue relationship with, 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 with your neighbor, for example? Um, so if you keep in front of you the whole idea that, you know, when all said and done, it's about connecting to another human being. I just let that be my, my guidepost for, for how, doing the work, moving it forward. So for me, the thing that I realized at some point during this was that, um, that the thing that I think a lot of people are craving is that the thing that we have lost um, is uh, random one-on-one -on -one encounters. That's, uh, you know, that, that's something that would happen to you if you go to a convention. It's something that would happen if you are in your neighborhood and you're, you're out um, that you, or, or at an office, that you, you bump into someone that you know and you have a random, short, brief, one-on-one -on -one encounter. It was a, an article that I read several years ago about how you make friends um, and why it's so difficult after a certain point in your life to, to make friends. And one of the things that they said that was a, a key thing was these random chance, small meetings, um, and then, and, and repeated random small meetings, uh, and then an opportunity to have solo conversation. So what I've been trying to do is create uh, opportunities for that. I have a, a daily co-working session, uh, two hours uh, every day during the week. Um, that people can drop into. And then one of the things that we've been doing is uh, much like with the nebulas, where you can break into smaller groups, making it easy for people to split off into smaller groups. But then and I've also been um, making a conscious effort to make appointments with friends. It's not random, but it's make appointments with friends for one-on-one -on -one time, even if we aren't in person. And that has been making a, a big difference. Um, the other thing uh, that I encourage other people to do, I realized that when I was going, I was going to, uh, I was reaching for uh, social media a lot because I was lonely, right? And I wanted that sense of community. And, and the problem is that it's this diffuse thing and it's not a sustained conversation. So what I have begun doing instead is I will just, uh, I've got a couple of friends uh, and I will randomly text them a, a picture like of my cat and we'll have a little bit of a conversation and then, you know, and then we both move on with our day. But it's, it is my version of trying to create that random bump into you in the hallway um, as a way to try to, uh, you know, try to mimic the thing that I'm missing. There is one thing that I'm going to push back on that, that Lynn said, because this piece of science makes me batty, uh, which is the idea that somehow seeing you is harder than talking on the phone or writing a letter. This rhetoric that we see about how much more difficult it is to communicate in Zoom is actually rhetoric that we saw with the invention of the telephone. We saw it with, uh, when we, when, when, with the penny post you know, it's like the letter is going back and forth too frequently. It wasn't, it wasn't a way that people were meant to contemplate their letters for long periods of time. So this is, this is, this is not, this is not actually that this takes more processing power. It's that it's a new paradigm and we're still adjusting to it. So there's my soapbox. Thank you very much. I've enjoyed standing on it. Also fair. And, and and this is confirmation bias since I just load the telephone. <laughs> Fair. You were meant for another time. Oh. <laughs> oh. Uh, I'd, I'd like to actually echo uh, Mary Robinette's uh, point about uh, that, that random interaction. Um, I, I made a, a joke on Twitter about turning my porch into my coffee shop since I no longer could go to the coffee shop. Um, and so I would just, so I said, well, I'm just going to sit on my porch and then my neighbors then become my the regulars at my my coffee shop and, uh, and I did that I made that joke about three weeks ago and then it's like it's like the universe decided no no 
that's actually going to become a thing. And so I've had neighbors randomly drop by to, and, and they'll social distance on the porch, but suddenly we're having these random interactions. And then, uh, and then I noticed that like some of the artists in town who do crave that companionship and do create, uh, com crave that wanting to be around other creatives, well, they'll just sort of schedule time to, hey, is the coffee shop open? We're just going to come and, and just hang out at the coffee shop. And I'm just like, I, I kind of love this. I could do this for a while, just so you all know. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Um, all right. Uh, well, I do. You mentioned food deserts in your work, Maurice, and I want to do uh, a little pitch for The Ache of Home, your story that appeared in Uncanny Magazine that uh, wove together everything from food deserts to urban fantasy in such an amazing way. I really loved it. And um, urban gardening as well. So thank you. Thank you to Maurice and Lynn for that story. That was great. Um, so, um, I think I think we're getting to a point where we are inching towards talking about activism in sci-fi. <laughs> so, I, I want to know your thoughts on that as as we're building community, as we're seeing things move forward. Um, how do you think, as a community, sci-fi um, will or will not react to this moment? How does this um, you know, kind of collide with? Um, own voices and uh, representation and um, disability and sci-fi, all of those things. Okay, so well, the first that, thing, the I first think... thing to you go. Go ahead, Mary Robinette. I was going to say well, the first thing to remember is that the science fiction community is not a monolith. <laughs> that is exactly what I was um, going to say. Those exact words. <laughs> Different parts of the community are going to react in different ways depending upon what those parts of the community view as their particular strengths, their particular lane, their particular areas where they can exert influence and or help push change or action. Um, and so to a certain extent, you're not going to get a singular experience from the science fiction community because everybody's going to react differently and make different choices based on what they feel they can bring to the table. Um, so, you know, I, I've been I've been conducting interviews for our new um, assistant editor for Uncanny because we're hiring someone to take the place of a staff member that's leaving and one of the things we're talk talking about is sort of framing what we think our lane is in the science fiction community in terms of providing a platform particularly for own voices stories, um, but in but pr providing a platform so that different kinds of stories from perspectives that have been less well represented historically are available to as many folks as we can possibly make them. And that's what we feel our lane is. That to us is activism in the same way that publishing a series of nonfiction articles about how to safely protest if you're going to an in-person protest is activism in our lane. I'm not in a position to go physically to a protest for myself, but I can aid other people who are doing that work. Um, and so that's one of the, you know, that's what we determined our lane was, but that's very much based on our situation and our bandwidth and our ability and the platform that we've developed. I was going to say all of those things, except not about uncanny. Um, <laughs> Which is ironic since we were both starting with, uh, with the, the premise that culture is not a monolith. Um, but, but it is, but I think it is really, really important to understand that um, everybody who comes into this has a different set of tools. And, uh, and that's, you know, that has to do with the privilege that you have uh, and, but also the way your own brain works and the way you interact with things. Um, I have, the the tool right now of being the president of science fiction and fantasy writers of America and also having a board that is very uh, we that's incredibly functional like they they really work very well together and have a common vision and so the thing that we have been doing is making choices about staffing to make sure that we are actively going after and recruiting recruiting people to, uh, to, uh, from, from communities that have traditionally been marginalized uh, to, for leadership positions. 
so that we are, uh, you know, we're, we're opening things up and, and trying to make sure that we're addressing this problem um, from as from as hot, you know, as close to top down as we can, because other people are doing the very hard work of coming at it and addressing it from different directions. Yeah, I, I, I look at it as uh, my writing being, well, no, I guess more like my community work informs my writing and my writing informs my community work. So it, it's, it's something that, that builds on each other. And so that I, I do have a certain intentionality to, to my writing and, uh, and I will just pop to that. Um, but that being said, it, uh, one of those things is uh, like you brought, brought up Ache of Home. Um, I love writing Ache of Home. But Ake of Home came at a cost. I got called into the principal's office because there were, you know, there were real world politics involved with that. Uh, and there were some city officials who took offense that I was criticizing and, or critiquing some of their methods of, of how they moved through the city. Which, yes, I got called into the principal's office. But I'm also going to count that as a victory because... I mean, that's literally the job of science fiction. I mean, we, we are pushing back on institutions, holding them accountable. And if they felt held accountable, good. <laughs> yeah, there are a lot of people who think that science fiction is is just escapist fair. And I think that there's nothing wrong with escapist fair. Like, that, that serves a useful function as well. But I do think that if you're not examining and, and questioning the... Uh, the biases that you come into it with, um, if you're not questioning the society that you're writing into, that you're missing out on on what it can do. You're missing out on opportunities. And there's nothing that says you can't have something that is good, fun, escapist, fair, and also social commentary. Like these are, and, and also I, I tend to think that everything is social commentary. It's just whether or not you're doing it on purpose. Well, and it's also whether the social commentary is coming from a perceived default or not. All art is not neutral. There's no such thing as neutral art. If you think that the art that you are consuming or creating is neutral, that just means that you're doing it from the position of being in the cultural default, whatever that happens to be, which, you know, in today's terms tends to be white, heterosexual, male folks. Um, but that is a perspective, it is not the only perspective, but it's not a neutral perspective. And, it, and that, I think, is something that we're all grappling with in this time, is that there was a perception for years and years and years that there was a neutral position, and that's simply not true. Um, and, and folks who thought that their perspectives were completely culturally neutral are now realizing that that is not the case. And that's new information for them. Um, and processing that information takes a while sometimes. Um, and it's challenging because folks think, oh, I just want some escapist fair. But again, if your escapist fair only has people that look and function exactly like you, you're only providing an escape for people who look and function exactly like you. And that's not everyone in the universe by any stretch of the imagination. So, I feel like neutrality I is not so possible. Clutch them. <laughs> <laughs> um, I I want to take it to questions pretty soon, but I have two more kind of large overall questions. Um, uh, the first one is, what advice do you have for some of the people uh, who are creators and writers in the audience right now? How are you uh, facing this moment as creators and writers? How are you getting through the day? <laughs> what What do you see as, as your hope uh, for the future right now to stay creative? <laughs> Ask me how late my is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so... I was actually so during the first month of the of, of the pandemic, uh, in, in the first month of the lockdown, um, I would hit this huge, huge block. I mean, there I, there was just move up. No, no words were being put on the page, none. Um, and I couldn't figure out what was wrong. I mean, I knew. I mean, yes, I'm at home, but you know, being at home shouldn't have been a stress for me. But um, I, I just couldn't figure out, you know, how how I was going to punch through this wall because I, I have a I had a novel due. <laughs> and so the idea of going a whole month with no words on the page, you know, it was starting to, uh, we'll just say, cause some mild anxiety for me, my agent, and my editor, we'll just say. Um, and then, uh, Mary Robinette, you'll love this. <laughs> um, some, uh, some of the writers from the Writing Excuses Cruise uh, reached out to me. 
uh, we had had this group called the B13 group, and that was, uh, yeah, uh, and, and that's and B13 referred to where we'd meet on the ship, and uh, when we get meet there late at night in our pajamas, and we just write, and that's all we would do. Um, and so they reached out, and they were like, "Hey, we want to reunite the group, and and, and just do it over Skype. Uh, you know, would you be interested?" And I was like, "Sure, let's try that." Um, and so, and there, there was like ten of us who got together. Um, and and I, and I was like, hey, I'm actually, I'm actually starting to write, um, because we we wrote together for like four hours straight. And then I'm like, wait a second, I wonder if that's what I was missing this uh, this whole idea of, or maybe that or not not what I was missing because I never wrote like that before, but the whole idea of you know I'm we are in this new moment, we could have to muddle through it together. Um, and so uh, after that sort of breakthrough moment, then I reached out to a couple of friends and said, hey, what would it look like uh, for us to regularly, you know, log into Zoom uh, Monday through Friday, 10 to whenever, um, and just, if nothing else, just be in the background of each other to sort of lightly hold each other accountable or just to just be, have that energy of presence with one another. Um, so I started that and then all of a sudden, no, that was the big breakthrough uh, for me. Um, I ended up writing, well, I won't even tell you how much I've written in the, in the last couple of months, but my editors and agents are, are all very happy right now uh, with, my, with my level of productivity. Um, but it all boiled down to, um, this, I, I think, it's just that, that invisible support that relationships offer. Yeah. I've been doing writing dates for years. So I, I deal with depression on a regular. Um, and it has, unsurprisingly been a problem um so uh, you know I've, I've basically been deploying every coping mechanism I've, I've ever had in my entire life and kind of cycling through them going is this one gonna work all right um but like maurice i set up uh writing dates um and the 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 reason that they work is there's a thing that we do as as people call mirroring it's where in person if uh, like if I pick up my water glass, there's a lot of people in the audience right now who have water nearby and they're like, oh, yeah, I am thirsty. Uh, and and we'll, you know, if you want to make someone else comfortable, you'll you'll take on their body posture. But when you it, it's a form of peer pressure, but it's not like a conscious pushing. It's 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 this thing that you do to, to belong. And so when you're in a room full of other people who are writing, you're like, oh, I guess that's the thing that I should be doing right now. And so it's it's super useful to have other people who are writing. It, it helps your brain prioritize and understand the task that you're supposed to be doing. And it gives you permission and space to do that thing. So I, I do that. Um, but the other thing that I would say for people um, who are struggling is, one, it's okay to take time off. Uh, two, if it's not okay to take time off, that... Um, you can do iterations of a thing. So do the piece of it that is the easiest. Like if you're good at dialogue, just put the dialogue down on page and then go back in and layer your description. Uh, if you are really good at plot, throw some plot down on the page and then flesh it out later. Just go ahead and, and work on easy setting. It's, it's completely fine. It's like going to the gym after you've been sick for a while. You, you, you step back on your routine. You, you go the, the, the easier things. Uh, those are all completely fine. And if, if you really need to, um, I, mean, I, I say this as if it's an extreme thing, but here's a thing that I highly recommend is write some fanfic. Like just go someplace that is comfortable and happy to remind yourself that writing is not stressful that it's something that you can do just because you love it, that there's no purpose in it other than just to satisfy yourself and and just to play with craft. You know, and you don't even have to do, like, it doesn't have to be anything that's going to fit into a canon. It doesn't have to be a complete story. Like, write, write something about Captain America having tea with Peggy, you know? Just something pleasant and then and and then there's a bomb but whatever just do something pleasant yeah, this is something that i've been struggling with sort of at the opposite end both mary robinette and, and maurice have talked sort of about battling kind of isolation in the sense of needing the the 
or, or craving the, the mirroring experience. Um, because in my day job, I'm, I, I've sold out, I'm on the dark side, I'm an administrator now. Um, I'm having the opposite problem of, yeah, I know, it's terrible. Um, of, I just, I, I've had meetings upon meetings upon meetings, so by the time I get to the end of my work day, um, the very last thing I wish to do is to spend time looking at other people on the internet. What I want to do is be under a blanket with a, with an adult beverage and murder she wrote because that's about the bandwidth I have at that point. Um, so for me, the big struggle during the pandemic um, has been being able to spend 20 minutes working on uncanny email in the evening because again I'm doing the I'm doing the next right thing that feels like it's within my bandwidth even if it's okay I can spend 15 minutes turning around contracts I can do that I can spend 10 minutes paying people well that's it I'm done for the night but that's progress um, you know I can read one story that needs a line in it that's progress um, and and working much harder um, to emphasize the types of self-care activities that historically I am completely pants at prioritizing. So um, I have been working much harder on making sure that my middle-aged backside gets out of bed in time to do yoga in the morning before I start my day and actually do the yoga. Um, that's been something that I've been more successful with in terms of doing the thing, but as Mary Robinette said, I, I had to back all the way up to essentially the easiest programs I could find um, for doing that because the first month of lockdown where it was me bolted to a not appropriate or ergonomic chair trying to have six hours of meetings a day meant that all of the flexibility and strength I had gained from my outside activity that was nearly a hobby before the lockdown stopped it, which was aerials classes, um, I, I lost all of that ground I had gained, so I had to start at the beginning again. Um, so that's been the thing for me is, is boundaries, um, actually taking care of myself. I am eating better, though, because we're cooking for ourselves a lot more often. Um, my, my ice cream intake has not been quite as epic as I anticipated, which is kind of nice. Um, and we're eating mostly healthy around that. So, um, But that I, that, I think, is the biggest challenge. And we moved house at the beginning of the pandemic, which also added a exciting layer of stress to the whole experience. <laughs> so, <laughs> my, my husband had his hip replaced at the beginning of pandemic, which was uh, interesting. <laughs> we already planned to be inside, and we had already stocked up on everything. Uh, so it was, it was just very surreal at the beginning. Um, so one more question from me, and then I want to open it up to our audience here for question and answer time. Um, we've, we've seen a lot, as, uh, Valerie Garver said, we're, we're seeing a lot of things from the, uh, 1918 pandemic, uh, the end we're thinking a lot about our place in history. So where do you want to see things in the next hundred years? How do you want this moment to be remembered? How do you hope that we will have come out of it? Let's do some uh, dreaming together now, some future telling of our own. Oh, this is like <laughs> the problem that I think we're probably all going to run into is that I don't see any realistic way out of the moment that we're in without bloodshed, uh, based on, on historical patterns. Um, but historically speaking, what's going to happen is that it's going to get real, real bad. Um, it feels bad right now. It's going to get worse. Uh, and then there's going to be a period of enormous hope and prosperity and regrowth. And the challenge that we're going to have and this is why like looking a hundred years out is is a challenge is that the other thing that always happens after a period of enormous hope and, and prosperity and growth is that there's a pushback and the people for whom there has been prosperity and growth have become complacent and let progress not always i i say let as if it's uh like look and i am thinking specifically um about uh, feminism um, that there was a because that is that's something that I have 
some direct lived experience with. Uh, but the number of young women that have told me that they've never experienced sexism. And then you start talking to them and they have, but it's just something that's so ingrained that they, they think of it as this thing that had happened to other people in the past. Um, they, they think of the worst examples and they don't see the things that are still happening and that the slow erosion of, uh, of the progress that is made. Um, but certainly when you look at what happened after the Civil War with the Reconstruction and the, and the New Jim Crow laws, when you look at the Civil Rights Movement, like this is a, it, it's really hard to map a pattern for the future uh, that is a, a beautiful, hopeful one because it requires a couple of th things. It requires someone in a leadership position to set the tone. And then it also requires a groundswell of people who are unwilling to let the status quo stand and will fight to maintain that new status quo. Sorry, and you wanted something real positive. I can't. <laughs> what? <laughs> no, 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 that, no. That's literally the plot of my of, of my of my sci-fi novel. Yeah. Um, you know, because I originally was trying to go. All right, well, what could it look like for black people to establish our, our own uh, intergalactic kingdom a thousand years in the future? And then, uh, and I start mapping out that timeline. I realize I can't think a thousand years in the future, but I can map out, you know, what the next hundred years or so might look like, and uh, and it does mirror exactly what what Mary Robinette said. Uh, you know, a, a collapse of many of the systems are uh, brought about by any of a number of either pandemics or climate uh, climate changes. You know, collapse is coming. That being said, there will be a time of that uh, that sort of rebirth, uh, uh, that that time of uh, that time of healing, that time of dreaming together, um, and then new things can grow and new things can. Uh, flourish, and uh, and that it's at that point that I pick up with the book. I, I'm gonna, you know, go into that moment of hope and go. You know what? Eh, we're good here. Uh, so it's the idea of first the collapse, then the healing, then the growth. So uh, that, that's kind of where where, uh, where my head's at. Uh, again, I Mary Robin and Maurice have pretty much covered it. It's it's the issue of. Um, there is no way forward that doesn't involve a lot of pain and suffering. We're already seeing that. It's going to get worse. My, the, the thing that I hope and, and want to hold on to and certainly is a major focus of the ethos of the kinds of things that we publish at Uncanny um, is, the, is reminding people that we do better when we take care of each other and when we commit collectively to the concept that we are better off taking care of one another than trying to be deeply individualistic in ways that are selfish and detrimental to society as a whole. Um, and that is, at this point, practically countercultural in many places, um, because American individualism in, it, in all of its John Wayne ruggedness is so pervasive in um, parts of our culture that people literally can't, like, there, there's, you know, there's all sorts of memes about people joking about the end times because they are survivalists and they've got their bunkers all set up and they're ready to defend them and theirs. And the folks in the fiction that I tend to prefer are the ones that look at each other and say, how do we survive this together? How do I help you to make sure that you're still here? Um, and the communities that grow out of that tend to be very strong communities and they're communities that have the ability over time to adapt uh, and to survive in ways, you know, all the zombie apocalypse literature that's out there, um, the communities that are the most successful are the ones that stick together and stick to the rules that they set for each other and hold each other accountable because that's how you survive. Um, so I want to be hopeful but History and experience have taught me that not everybody's on that page, and it takes a while to get people there. And that is ultimately the frustration of the build-up towards the point where we can get to the hopeful part. Well, thanks for being a downer, everybody. <laughs> no, um, humans, man. Yeah, that's, like, <laughs> that's my job. Yeah. Well, no, I, I, I mean, I agree with there, what you. There is actually. Uh, there, there is actually one model. There, there are a couple of models for 
um, but but again, you, it, it's it's having that tone setter. Um, but one of the things that is interesting to look at is um, how other countries reacted to the French Revolution. Um, and like most of the other countries in in and around Europe, in and around France, um, reacted. And, and Britain Britain was interesting because it was nearly on the point of a collapse. It, that was exactly like what was happening in France. And they saw what was happening in France and actually managed to pull back and change course. Uh, and and that's an interesting thing to look at how they went about that. It provides a, a useful model. Um, unfortunately, we are missing several of the key pieces that they had to make that model. But it is it is it, the this for for people who are writing fiction, um, knowing that there's a model out there means that this kind of thing that we're experiencing is not inevitable. It's just likely. Well, hopefully with what we're doing here and conversations like this and the work that you're doing in your community building, we can avoid the worst of it and get back to that groundswell of hope. I'm, I'm looking for the, the up after the down. Uh, <laughs> so on that note, uh, why don't we, I'm going to open up the Q&A chat area and you can submit your questions to us and I will do my best uh, to uh, communicate them to our panelists. What made you want to start writing? I mean, there's not a point that I don't remember writing. Like the, the first story that I remember writing was in kindergarten. Um, the thing that made me go, huh, maybe this is a career thing that I could possibly do, um, was I had, uh, I had had a severe puppet injury um, and started writing again. And it reminded me how much I enjoyed um, that connection with that, that different kind of connection with an audience. Um, I like shaping worlds. Um, I like problem solving. I like the craftsmanship of it and it does not hurt as much as puppetry does. Yeah, I, I too, I can't remember not writing. Um, when I first came to this country, it, I was uh, in the second grade and uh, the teacher didn't know what to do with me. So she literally put me in the back of the classroom, gave me a stack of paper and just said, yeah, you're just gonna create this year. And I'm just like, oh, I love American schools. This is great. <laughs> Um, and so I've been writing uh, ever since, and uh, I think writing is just fundamentally part of who I am. Um, so I mean, even if I was never having another book or another story published, I mean, I'm still going to you know spend my time several hours a day writing um, because I write for me. Um, I have uh, half a dozen novels in my in my trunk right now with, that I've written just because I like to write them. Um, and at some point I might go and go, hey, maybe I'll try pursuing publishing them. But the the main joy of it for me was writing those writing those books, uh, wrestling with those characters and, uh, and going on their journeys with them. So, um, yeah, I think uh, fundamentally just writing is just what I'm about. And I'm just weird because I'm not actually a writer. Um, fundamentally, I'm a reader and I have a bachelor's degree in comparative and French literature and I have a master's degree from NIU in English and American literature. Um, and so I have an entire background and life experience that is all about looking at stories and picking them apart and trying to figure out why they work and why they don't work. And it turned out to be really great training for being an editor, even though I entered editing science fiction with, quite frankly, no background in science fiction as a genre, really. Um, I gained my sea legs as a science fiction reader and um, editor while I was at NIU curating the SF F collections that are now there. Um, so for me, it was I learned on the job uh, a lot of what I now know. Um, but the tools for understanding story and structures and how to break it apart and how to how to point to the parts that are working and the parts that aren't, and being able to communicate that with a writer to a writer so that I can help them make their story better um, is a skill set that I've had the, the privilege of growing over the past decade. And quite frankly, it's way easier than writing. You know, pointing to, to one section of a story and being like, this part doesn't work. The rest of it's great, but this little part, this mm, doesn't quite work, and here's why it doesn't work. But without having to be the person who comes up with how to fix it, that's easy. That's great. That's way more fun than writing. <laughs> 
I know how much work writing is at this point, and I'm not willing to put it in, quite frankly. I'm happy to be a reader and an editor. That's, that's a better fit for me as a person. <laughs> Um, another question we got was advice for writer's block. You've talked about it pandemic-wise, uh, some of the great things that you've been doing to stay creative. But just how about that kind of that day-to-day -day grind of writing or producing a magazine? Deadlines. So okay, yeah, <laughs> deadlines. Deadlines help. Well, deadlines. deadlines help some people. Some people, they make worse. Mm -hmm. Um, yes. I, I have a blog post uh, called uh, Sometimes Writer's Block is Really Depression. Uh, but it's really, so it, it, it's about um, the fact that writer's block is a, a gift most of the time because it helps you identify a problem in the story. Because if it's not depression, then it's a problem in the story. And I say depression, like, uh, because it can also be, you know, just angst or I'm moving. There can be like, but it's some, ex some factor that is external to the story. Um, but anything that is a problem with the story and you've got writer's block, if you can identify why you're blocking on it, it's it's an absolute gift because it tells you where the problem is with the story. That said, I'm going to give you a website that I want you to go to. Get ready. You're going to write down the number four, thewords.com. It is a role-playing game in which the metric for defeating monsters is the number of words you write and the time in which you write them. It is highly addictive in the best possible ways. I find that I am willing to write to earn a pair of virtual wings that I will never get to touch, but they're so pretty and I will not write for a paycheck. Forthewords.com, highly recommended as a way to get yourself, it, it gives you, an, it, it, basically what it does is it externalizes the process and gives you a sense of progress. Yeah, uh, writer's block, I, I think I've only ever truly experienced writer's block maybe three times in my career, uh, not including the, the initial well at the uh, beginning of the pandemic. Um, but uh, looking back, I've managed to identify, you know, what it was that was causing the writer's block. And two of them were external. Um, I was working through grief uh, in one case. And another case, it was um, just a lot of stuff going on in my personal life. And then in the last one, it was just anxiety of how to wrap up a trilogy. So, um, but in all cases, it's, you know, sometimes writer's block is just a matter of giving yourself permission to have writer's block because it's literally not the end of the world. Uh, a lot of the times writer's block is, for, or at least for me, is, you know what, the story's not ready yet, but I'm going to trust that the, the creative muscle here knows what it's doing because it's done it for a while and it'll work itself out. I just need to give it time to do it. And time might mean... Uh, you know, I am uh, going and doing dishes or, you know, or time might mean I'm going to take the first four weeks of the pandemic and manage my anxiety by cooking these really extravagant meals that my family is drowning in now. Uh, but that's OK. Um, it'll, it'll work itself out. Um, so. Uh, so, yeah. So uh, I, writer's block. Get, like I said, for me, I give myself permission to have the writer's block. That, it, it's OK. As an editor, it's a little bit of a different experience because I'm not producing words, but I'm trying to, to curate other people's work. Um, so for me, the experience of writer's block is much more about um, having days where my taste is suspect because I will read through a pile of stories that have come in through the slush or whatever, and I just literally hate everything. And that's usually the point where I realize I probably need to hydrate, go have a sandwich, or take a nap. Um, because what my brain is telling me is that I'm not in a place to be able to discern between stories that are working and stories that are not. Because if I hate everything, it's not the story's fault, it's the fault of my brain, which is not getting what it needs for me to be able to use that muscle of being able to discern between stories that are working and stories that are not. So for me, it's an indicator that I, I have missed out on some type of um, caring for the, the meat um, that is keeping my brain from doing what it needs to be doing. Um, and you know, we have, a, we have a rule in our household after long experience of there are days when one is deeply underslept because of reasons that are out of your control. And we do not make major life decisions on those days, if at all possible. Um, and you know, we will, my, my husband and I will look at each other and say, this is not a day to make major life choices. The, the, the most rigorous choice making we're doing here is what are we ordering for dinner? Um, anything, anything that is higher stakes than that needs to wait until tomorrow if it possibly can. Um, 
and that is something that um, has been an important lesson in our household because because our daughter is disabled and we live with disability as part of our lives, um, that affects how we handle the ebb and flow of energy and the ebb and flow of our ability to make art. Um, and so one of the hardest lessons as we have gone through our life trying to create art while raising our daughter um, is the understanding that humans have limits and you can't actually push yourself through forever. You will collapse and that there are better ways to manage that so that the collapse doesn't happen and instead you make space and then you can start again. Um, and that's that's a tough lesson to learn over and over again. But I think that I, my experience of that feels similar to what writer's block can be like. Um, it's often a message from your back brain saying, hey, something's not right here. And if you can pick apart the not right part, you can get back to producing the words and the, and the creative energy flowing again, because something's blocking it. OK, that, those are great answers. And um, so certainly in the world of writing and publishing, there is a lot of rejection. <laughs> there is a lot of hopefully productive struggle. And uh, one of the questions is, was there ever a point where you wanted to give up? And how did you move past that? There have been individual projects I've wanted to give up on, but never the, the whole process. Um, and with the individual projects, I some of them I've put down and never gone back to. Um, and some of them, it was just a more extreme form of writer's block, so it just took me a while to identify why I was unhappy with it. I, I will also tell you, by the way, uh, that there is a thing called the three-quarter effect, which is that when you are two-thirds to three-quarters of the way through any given thing, whether it's writing or a road trip or term paper or, or a puppet tour, um, you feel like you cannot possibly finish it. And there's two reasons that it happens. One is because what your brain does is measures the amount of time that you have spent on it and mistakenly thinks that that is how much time you have remaining. So it feels like you still have significantly farther to go than you actually do. And the other thing is because you're switching modes from um, a kind of opening boxes to having to pack things again. Uh, and if you've ever pulled anything out of a box from Ikea and attempted to return it to the box, you know that unpacking is significantly easier than packing. So that, that mode change is, is really difficult. And for most things, it happens around that three quarter mark where you're beginning to, to close things down again, or at least looking towards that. So once you understand, so when I hit that that point, I almost inevitably is like, whoa, this is terrible. I hate everything, and life is awful, and I can't. I want to stop. Uh, and then I'm like, oh, hey, look, uh, consistently, three quarter mark. Good, good job, good job, brain, on doing that every single forking time. <laughs> I, I'm a multiple. I'm a multiple project procrastinator. That's how I tend to cope with not wanting to finish one thing. I move on to another thing that is suddenly shinier than the thing I'm supposed to be working on. Um, but there are definitely projects that are subject to the three quarters problem. Um, in my case, they're knitting projects that are sitting in a closet. There's a shawl that has been. There's a. There's a, a, a Jane Austen lace shawl that I have been working on for literally seven years that is at the three quarter point and. It seems so far away. It's really just in the spare bedroom closet. Um, but I have so many other things I could be working on right now. And so it gets deprioritized until I feel the need to pick it up again. Um, because eventually something else will get to that three quarter point, And I won't want to deal with that. And then I'll go to a different project instead. And so that's, that's how I get things done in a general sense. Um, I do research as part of my faculty position in my day job. And I have three research projects going on right now that are radically different from each other in terms of topic. Um, and so when I'm deeply frustrated with, with the article about uh, a television series that I love, I can move on to the survey where I have to be trying to figure out how to wrangle Excel spreadsheets instead. It's a different enough activity for my brain that I can switch gears and make progress on that. When I get frustrated with Excel, I can move on to the other book, pro pr book proposal I was working on with someone different about archives and time travel. So I can just bounce between projects, and that makes it a little bit more 
productive when one thing gets blocked. I can just shift gears. That's something that's worked really well for me. Uh, for me, it's something similar. Um, I have uh, uh, what's called hypomania. And so, uh, so I typically am working on uh, a dozen or so project, writing projects at a time because uh, for similar reasons to Lynn and then plus that's just the way my brain's wired. I need to have a lot of shiny objects to, b to bounce between. Um, and so, uh, so if I get blocked half the time, I don't even notice I'm blocked on one thing because I'm already working on something else. Um, that being said, the, the only times I've ever really wanted to give up on a project usually involves other people, not so much the project itself. Like either there's a, <laughs> a, a client or an editor that's being problematic that I'm just like, you have drained all the fun out of me uh, procrastinating on this project. So, uh, you know, I, it, it's just, I go into, you know, table flip mode and, you know, rage quit. And then my wife will remind me that we still have bills to pay. So... We can't really for, uh, afford this moment of uh, artistic angst, so uh, I, you know I'll come back around. But uh, yeah, it, I, I really like the method of having a bunch of different things to bounce between because it just keeps my brain, you know, occupied. Okay, um, I've got. I'm going to kind of combine two questions. So, what do you like to do when you're not writing? And also uh, to follow that up, what do you like to read when you're not? Um, writing or, or producing a magazine? What, what are your comfort reads right now? Uh, I really like napping. <laughs> mm -hmm. napping That's is, a hobby I'm I need to take up more. Yeah, I'm, I'm a real big proponent of napping. Uh, I mean, I, I crochet, I, I cook. Um, I, I used to really enjoy travel, <laughs> but, uh, but I'm a big, big, big fan of napping. We just bought a hammock. Uh, to go in the, the yard and I um, uh, put it, hung it right before this and I'm, forgive me, resenting all of you right now because I'm not outside in the hammock um, <laughs> watching fireflies. Uh, no offense to anyone involved. Um, what was the second part of uh, Comfort reads. Oh, comfort reads. I am reading um, Hank Green's new book. Um, and really enjoying it. Um, but one of the weird things that happens to you as a writer, when they, they say, hello, and now you're an author, congratulations, is that you do a lot of um, uh, reading arcs, uh, advanced review copies to blurb them for other authors. So I don't actually do that much leisure reading anymore. Like I'm reading books that I enjoy, but I can't, it's, they're not necessarily things that I pick. Yeah, because uh, my comfort reading is, had, had, past tense, had always been uh, crime fiction. I, I love crime fiction. That was always my, my uh, go-to genre when I wanted to relax and, uh, and, and just be absorbed into, into the page. But um, like Mary Robinette said, there, there's, I, I don't get a lot of that anymore, um, partly because, uh, you know, I came into science fiction late, so I'm feel like I'm playing catch up on, on the genre in, in a lot of ways too. Um, and so, so like right now, but you know, I bounce back and forth between reading uh, philosophical books. Like uh, I got, I'm looking at my stack right now going, uh, seeing The Wretched of the Earth by Frantz Fanon. You know, so I, I love philosophical books um, uh, and, or emergent strategy, you know, things that, things that just get my, my brain going. Um, and then, you know, then genre books usually uh, here anymore. Um, but then when I'm not writing, uh, you know, I'm, I will either, you know, have, like, I, I consume a lot of television. I ain't going to lie. I consume a lot of television. Like, uh, for me, I'll, I'll go through a season of something in, what, a day or two? Uh, it, it's, it's a ridiculous amount of television I watch. And, and either that or I'm just playing games with my kids. Uh, and I say kids even though I'm now the parent of adults because my youngest just turned 18, and they celebrated by jumping out of a plane, which I still cannot put my head around, that both my children and my wife jumped out of a perfectly fine functioning plane. Um, See, I, I learned to fly a plane. That, that was my, that was my, that was how I, I like, the jumping out more, is, I, yeah. A much more rational choice. I so much more appreciate that. So, uh, but yeah, running around with my family is, uh, is, is, is you know, 
and we'll consume TV together. So it works out well. TV, video games, uh, that is our, our go-to. Uh, I call it the mashed potatoes of our lives. <laughs> I have been... Um... I bounce between reading science fiction and fantasy and reading romance, and um, romance has been my comfort fiction for decades. Uh, and uh, in the middle of this pandemic, I have no shame about the fact that I have ripped through multiple romance series, uh, as well as rereading beloved series uh, as a way of comforting myself through all of this, especially because we came through, before the pandemic, a three-month period where our daughter was hospitalized. Um, so we started the pandemic with our tanks empty to begin with basically because we had just gotten through that and then the pandemic hit so um, yeah I've been reading a metric ton of romance and one of the most joyous things for me during this pandemic is that about 18 months ago I read the first novel I had experienced for myself um, by Beverly Jenkins who's a black romance writer uh, and it turns out Beverly Jenkins has been writing for decades and there is a really enormous backlog that I have been wading through and enjoying the heck out of. Um, I'm looking for fluffier things right now because that's what I need. Um, the other thing I'm reading, which I had not had the pleasure of doing before, which is actually sitting right here, it's vaguely work-related, so it feels okay. Um, this is To Say Nothing of the Dog by Connie Willis, which is a comic time travel novel uh, that I'm about halfway through. Uh, so that's been the other thing that I have been enjoying recently. Um, I'm holding off on Doomsday Book because I know that one is not comic. Uh, so, and it's about the plague. So I'm not reading that one just yet. Um, but that's, that's, I have been mainlining romance and the fluffier side of SFF as much as I can manage it. I have a long stack of things that I want to be reading or should be reading um, by folks whose work I adore. Um, but I just haven't had the bandwidth to actually focus enough to sink in and enjoy it. And I want to wait until I'm in that space because I think it's a disservice to their work if I'm not in the right space to read it. Yeah. Um, I've been reading a lot of horror. I don't know why. Or horror comedy. <laughs> it's my comfort read and all of your books, of course. Um, I am really excited to see what happens okay. with the, with our lady astronauts being on Mr. Wizard and inspiring all those girls. I'm loving it. Um, so um, I'm getting lots of great questions. I think this is an interesting question to ask, uh, but as, as the asker of the question, uh, but maybe it puts you on the spot, are there certain themes that you find yourself coming back to again and again? Is there is there some driving question that you're seeking to answer or something that you hope people will take away from your work? Uh, like, so there are questions that I have and I will explore those questions when I'm writing. Um, and but uh, like theme feels like something that uh, someone else decides that I put into the novel. Um, someone read my early stuff and said that thematically that I continued to look at what is the nature of art, uh, which I think was actually probably true of a lot of the the glamorous history stuff. Um, but but I think for me the thing that I keep like right now and have been looking at is um, you know of of your of your various loyalties which one is truest to who you are you know uh, there, there's the like, when we it, it's questions of self-definition like how do we how do we define who we are how is that definition of who we are shaped by the way we're viewed and the actions that we choose to take um you know whether whether it's a, a choice between family or career and the moment when you have to decide which of those is more important to you and it should be very clear and it's not always and uh so th those are the things that i kind of keep noodling at but i i don't ever what i my my philosophy, I don't ever want to put an necessarily an, an answer into a book. Like for me, the thing that is interesting about 
um, any form of art, uh, whether it's a puppet show or, or a book. But with those two in particular, um, the, the work exists in a space between the creator and the audience. So um, there's a saying that we have in puppetry, you know, do you know what the difference is between uh, playing with dolls and a puppet show? And the answer is that one of them has an audience. And what happens is that, you know, I put this inanimate object on the stage and it relies on you agreeing that it is alive. I put words on a page and I hand them to you and I rely on you filling in all of those other details that I don't put in there and fleshing it out. So the story that you're reading is a story that is unique to you because you bring half of it in there. So for me, what I want to do is I want to ask questions and give you space to answer them because the answers that you come up with are going to be different than the ones that I come up with. I may have opinions and those opinions may be clear on the page, but that does, that's not the same thing as having an answer. It's, it's, a, it's a dialogue. And I come at it from the other side, which is I don't give a crap what you think um, <laughs> as a reader. So uh, I, have, I have a couple of different things that I realize that pop up a lot in my, in my stories and in my, in my novels. Um, a recurring theme seems to be this, uh, like, like with Mary Robinette, this idea of identity, either as an individual or, or, as, a, or as a group. Um, I'm, I always seem to come back to examining that, that idea of identity. Um, I, I often seem to... Uh, you know, uh, play with the idea of what does uh, belonging look like, be it home, the idea of home, the idea of family, what does belonging look like? Um, so so those, you, you'll often see those threads uh, through a, a, big, a big chunk of my work. Um, but as I'm thinking through you know, a lot of my things, uh, I, I think I, I really like examining and critiquing systems. Um, I think of my, 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 uh, my, my two most recent books. So we have uh, The Usual Suspects, which is a, a middle grade detective novel. But it's a, it's a critique of the educational system. Um, and what does it mean, or what does it look like for young black males who have been given this label to navigate that system? Um, or we got uh, Pimp My Airship, which is, you know, I call it a comic romp through oppressive systems because that's what I do. Um, uh, but you know, it examines a, a variety of, of different uh, oppressive systems. It's just I, I'm, I'm doing it from a, a place of I don't know what place I was doing it. Um, I was probably drinking a lot. But uh, but that's another one of those books that I, I wrote just for me, and uh, and I actually hadn't intended to even publish that book. Thank you again, Mary Robinette, because. It, that uh, I, oh, I don't even think I told you about this. Oh, hey, uh, all y'all, uh, you don't need to listen to this part. But so Mary Robinette, when I was doing the the, the writing excuses uh, season with you guys, um, and we were talking about different books, and I I had written Pimp My Airship, and so to me it was a completed book that I'd written just for me. Um, but I would talk about it like it was a live thing, and I did it on writing excuses. And then when the episodes aired. Uh, I started getting all these emails about where can we get this book? Where can we get this book? And I'm like, it's in my drawer. Why? <laughs> you know. And so then it was this big, man, I think people really want to read this book. So then it became this rush to uh, get Pip My Airship out, all because I was on, on the Writing Excuses show. So, so that happened. So thank you. <laughs> this gives me so much joy. Yeah. <laughs> so hopefully I so answered that question for yeah. <laughs> so, for, so for Uncanny, I don't know if there's actually a particular theme because one of the things that we, 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 we approach fiction editing sort of, um, for those of you that are old enough to remember this technology, we approach it like, a, like creating a mixtape. Um, we're often looking for a series of moods or a series, a series of emotional experiences or an emotional arc as you go through an issue and we try uh, within the confines of the lengths of the different kinds of stories that we have to program it sort of like that. Um, that said, I think that if you are looking for sort of what the ethos of Uncanny is, um, which is not the same thing as a theme, because themes are different ways to riff on the fundamental ethos. Um, are you familiar with Linus from the Peanuts and the Great Pumpkin? 
he's the sincerest pumpkin in the patch, and I think that really is the ethos of Uncanny. Like, we feel ourselves to be the sincerest pumpkins in the patch. And the challenge with that is that it's not always easy to be the sincerest pumpkin in the patch because people are not always nice about the great pumpkin. You miss out on Halloween occasionally. You miss out on trick-or-treating. Um, sometimes being sincere means speaking truth to power or, or providing stories that make people uncomfortable because it encourages them to think about things they didn't need to think about before. But sometimes being the sincerest pumpkin means that you just want to throw some glitter and see what happens and have a party with your friends, and that's okay too. Um, and I think that fundamentally, the fact that we are Peanuts fans and Doctor Who fans means that our ethos at its core is we are sincere pumpkins who try to choose to be kind and put that out into the world. It doesn't always go as well as we'd like, um, but that's, I think, what our ethos is. And, you know, I should note that editing is fundamentally an act of hubris. As an editor, you firmly believe that you have really excellent taste and that other people will clearly want to Pur want to purchase and pay money to read the things that you personally, with your excellent taste, have selected. So it's a sincerity that comes out of hubris, which is a really fun place to be. Uh, although I will point out that at least in your case, you you do actually have really excellent Thank you. taste, and, and people do want to pay money. <laughs> they do. I mean, we 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 did we did manage to have a proof of concept that turned out really well, but the initial impetus to create comes out of this little kernel of hubris of, I have really excellent taste in stories. I think I should do something with that. <laughs> um, I mean, that's the same thing that drives a lot of writers. That, like, you know, why, why do you publish the thing? There's the writing it, but why do you publish it? Because you think other people should read this. I'm so everybody can see how great I am, right? Isn't that why anybody does anything? <laughs> yeah. This is this is why I have long hair so I can flip it. Um, I have, Same. Yeah. <laughs> I have. Well, you you get to do the smooth. Yeah, sure. I have. A, I there's a lot of good questions, but I've I think I've got one more to kind of uh, wrap things up. Uh, so we don't. I could talk to you all night, but other people, uh, you know, Mary Robinette needs to get to her hammock and her fireflies. So. Um, <laughs> understandably so. Um, no so, um, science fiction often relies on some kind of magic technology to help the story along or make it possible, whether it's faster than light travel or alien transports. What kind of magic technology would you like to see come out of all the science that's happening in the pandemic? And uh, where, where would you like that to go, if we're being hopeful? Uh, what I would like to see is um, a magical clearinghouse of shared information that uh, fast-tracked peer review in a way that was safe and sustainable um, and also incentivized people to share information instead of hoarding it. Hmm. If we're talking about stuff strictly out of the pandemic. Also, better mask technology. I think strictly out of the pandemic, I want to see building better sustainable systems for taking care of each other. I mean, so much of the awfulness of this pandemic has been because it has exposed so many cracks in our systems that um, make it very, very clear who is valued in our society and who is less valued in our society, and the systems that are set up to keep those demarcations as strictly in place as humanly possible by the people who are maintaining those systems. Um, I would love to see some new systems spring up out of the remains of what we're going through. Um, and I would like to see those systems be about equity and inclusion and good science and educating folks so that equity and inclusion and good science can help us move forward and survive climate change, which is the other thing that we're pointedly ignoring at the moment. If we survive this, that's what's coming next. And boy, howdy, is that scary. So yeah. yeah. Um, I think I'm pretty much in the same boat. Uh, 
I think as I've been thinking through different uh, science fiction models, especially for my, my book and everything, it's it all comes down to what, what, what are the kind of things I'd like to see different? Well, one of the things would be, well, a different economic system, um, one that, uh, you know, values people um, a, a, as its base, um, one that values teachers, values artists, values scientists. Um, so, so that's one thing. And then, frankly, a, 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 a better educational system uh, entirely. Um, that's one thing I've been thinking about, you know, as I, you know, I'm, I'm looking at, you know, the, in the next three weeks reporting back to in-person school uh, with middle schoolers, um, you know, are there ways we could educate uh, one another better? So, so it, uh, it boils down to, you know, can we value each other better? Or what are the systems we could put in place that would allow us to value one another better? Can, can I put in a plug for a book? Um, it's called Stealing Worlds by Carl Schroeder. And the entire premise of the novel is about how we actually have all of the resources that, 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 that there are enough resources on the planet. It's just that they're unevenly distributed and using the technology that we have at hand now to, um, to, to distribute things fairly. Well, the answer I was looking for was jetpacks. So I think we're going to have to wrap this up. <laughs> <laughs> We've all failed. <laughs> jetpacks are a terrible idea. So I don't trust people with cars. I don't want them to have three dimensional. I know. No, I've been watching jetpacks the Mandalorian explode cars. for several years, and it just doesn't seem like a good thing. But um, I, I want to give you the all. The only thing worse than jetpacks. Oh, so I, I was just saying the only thing worse than jetpacks is the whole idea of flying cars. Because I'm like, I'm looking at my kids right now going, you know, they try to push it on E as long as possible. So I can't imagine if those cars were flying, what that would look like. So, uh, yeah, there's some technologies I'm not looking forward to. <laughs> so uh, I want to give everybody a chance to uh, say final thoughts. Any other um, book recommendations or things that you're working on that you want people to know about? I know that uh, some of you have brand new things out right now. So uh, final thoughts. Lynn. Uh, the thing we're working on right now with Uncanny is we are preparing to launch our Kickstarter for the seventh year of Uncanny. So um, if you like what Uncanny does and you wish to see us continue for an additional year, um, we are launching that in roughly the first week of August. Um, it's nearly there. We're, we're putting the finishing touches on the campaign. Um, and so uh, we'll be raising money to be able to publish the magazine for our seventh year. Um, that's what we're working on right now, along with just, you know, surviving and trying to take care of each other and, and day job. And, and I'm learning to be a homeowner again because we just bought a house. So um, I'm getting much better at painting. It's very exciting. <laughs> All right. Uh, Maurice. See, uh, final thoughts. I move, I work, and I write from a place of future hope. Um, I'm always want to be very intentional about uh, directing myself towards the world I want to see. Um, I have, um, see, so yeah, I've, uh, well, the usual suspects is about to come out in paperback uh, in the next couple weeks. Um, I, I've been really pleased. It's been popping up on on lists on. Uh, for how to talk to your kids about racism. I, I, it really kind of uh, pleased me by the, the kind of impact the book's having. Um, and then I have, uh, then next year will just be a busy year because I have uh, two books coming out. Uh, the first book of my uh, space opera will be out, uh, Sweep of Stars, and then uh, uh, another middle grade book, Unfadeable, will be coming out. So uh, Unfadeable, you know, I, I basically look at it, I only write from two different places. I'm either writing to critique uh, where, where we are now and, and what life's like in the neighborhood. And then I'm just, all right, and then I just want to dream about better futures. So that's, that's my whole writing life right now. <laughs> um, so I think that my, my thoughts would be that, um, that, that society is made of individuals and as individuals, we have the power to make choices and those choices don't have to be big choices. They can be small choices. Um, and finding the times that you can make the kinder choice, whether that kind choice is to step in and protect someone, um, or that kind choice is to be understanding or compassionate, um, or, or whatever that is, but trying to find ways to, to build towards hope. 
Uh, and then the other thing is, <laughs> hey, look, I have a new book. It came out last week. <laughs> um, Relentless Moon, uh, which is, um, if you feel like reading about a polio epidemic uh, uh, on the moon, that is not actually what the book is about. It is an event that happens in the, the book. It is a spy novel on the moon. Um, they're just, they're just <laughs> With a dash of polio. <laughs> Excellent. With a dash of polio. <laughs> dash of polio and rocketry. All right. Also, because I knew Lynn was going to be here and we were going to be talking some library stuff, I specifically wore a cardigan tonight. Uh, so Solidarity. I appreciate your sartorial choices. It's always good to represent the library cardigan cabal. <laughs> <laughs> well, and on that note, I think we should thank the um, NIU libraries and the Friends of the Library and NIU STEAM for making all of this possible tonight. <laughs>